Okay, in the first example, let's return back to the um, first law video where we looked at a tug of war between Steve and Sally and between uh, Jamie and Jose. So in that one, we found that the uh, Jose required 520 newtons and he could bring the whole system to equilibrium and that would cause the, uh, the uh, rope to then travel with constant velocity. But in this case, you can see Jose is only exerting 490 newtons to the right now, so that's going to unbalance the rope. It's going to make the, those people who are pulling to the left exert more force than the people to the right, and that's going to cause the object to experience a net force to the left, and therefore an acceleration to the left. So in this first problem, let's just calculate what is the actual amount of the net force. What's the amount of the imbalance? Because clearly the two forces, all the forces are close to each other, um, but when we know that they're not going to add up correctly because Jose is not exerting enough force. So let's just draw the free body diagram showing these four forces acting to the left with 450. And I'll draw a slightly shorter arrow to represent the 350 also to the left. Even shorter arrow yet to represent the 280. And then Jose is now going to exert 490. So pretty close, they look pretty close to being balanced, but if we just go ahead and add them up, so I'm being asked for the net force, and there are two ways that I could get the net force. One is I could use the mass and the acceleration of the object, and the other way would be to just add up the individual forces. So this is the route that I'm taking in this particular problem, is to add up those individual forces. So you can, again, you can do it in whichever order that you'd like to. If you would like to list the numbers in order going straight across the diagram, that makes complete sense. Um, you just need to make sure that those forces that point to the left get a negative sign, and the ones that point to the right get a positive sign, and everything is still going to work out fine. So when we add these up, we know that these added up to 800, but now Jose is 30 newtons short uh, because he needs to add, he needs to supply 520 newtons. So that means that the net force is equal to minus, minus 30 newtons, or that is to say that there's an excess amount of force and that force is to the left with a value of, of 30 newtons. So now, when, we, when we're asked to calculate the acceleration, we can use this equation that says that F net equals MA. So we want A. So I'm just going to divide, I'm going to detach the M by dividing by it. And that will be F net divided by M, just like Newton's second law states, that the acceleration is directly proportional to the net force, inversely proportional to the mass. So just plugging those numbers in, negative 30, divided by 6.2 would give you an acceleration of 4.84 meters per second squared. Make sure to plug that in your calculator and make sure that you're, you're able to produce the same answer. Uh, and as I pointed out, that acceleration would be negative because the, it's going to start accelerating to the left, which we have decided is going to be the negative direction. So in that problem, it was just a simple addition subtraction problem. You're given a bunch of forces, some left and some right, but you were basically told what the value of all of the forces were. Um, and that maybe made the problem just a little bit easier. So let's look at a problem where we're not given all of the forces, but we are given a lot of the forces that are acting on, on an object. So um, really common problem, we'll look at things like cars and bikes or people on skateboards, um, people running. Um, but accelerating on a horizontal, horizontally flat surface. So this is a, a pretty basic problem. Not a lot of forces are acting on the object. But before I, before I uh, go through and solve the, for the math of the problem, I am going to draw a free body diagram based on what is being described to me as the circumstances of this car and its motion. So a 950 kilogram car, that's the mass of the car. Even though it doesn't say it's the mass, I know it is because I can see the units say kilograms, and kilograms is the unit for mass. So a 950 kilogram car is accelerating at five meters per second squared when it produces a thrust force of 5,000 newtons. Determine the total frictional force acting on the car. So just to, as, a, as a way of practicing, since this is a really important aspect of identifying the forces acting on an object, I am going to draw a free body diagram for this one. And I'm going to identify all the forces, not just only the horizontal forces like the frictional force or the thrust force, but also vertical forces like the weight And of course, the car is being supported from underneath by the roadway, 
and I know that those two forces are balanced in length. And the reason is because the car is not accelerating vertically. There's nothing happening vertically. It's not even moving up or down, much less accelerating up or down. So those two arrows should be pretty close to the same length. And then horizontally, there's a thrust force, which is propelling the car forward. And there is also a frictional force opposing it. And I know when I draw this arrow, I'm going to draw it a little bit shorter because I know that it's telling me that the car is accelerating in the positive direction. So that means that the thrust is winning that battle, the battle of the balance between the horizontal forces. So ultimately, in this problem, we're really only going to be concerned with the horizontal forces because vertically we already know what's happening. And we're never going to write the net force equation acting on an object and try to take everything into consideration all at once. We're always going to break it down into either the horizontal motion, like we looked at in the last problem, or we may look at only the vertical motion, as we'll see in a problem coming up in just a little bit. Um, but ultimately, we're only going to look in one dimension at a time, either vertically or horizontally. So in this case, I want to look at it horizontally because my problem is asking about the frictional force. So what I know is that if, if you think about what we're looking for here, I don't care what the net force is. I'm not being asked for the net force, and there's, it's not needed for me to calculate the net force. So when I look back at my three options, what can I do to use this equation, that Newton's uh, expression of the, first, of the second law, is I can do this one. So I know that I have the mass and the acceleration of the vehicle. Those are listed for me there and there. And I was given at least one of these individual forces. And so what I'm missing is one of these individual forces. So this is the way that I want to go. Now I could use this to calculate the net force and then set it equal to MA, but probably easier, just go straight for the answer. We'll never calculate the net force, and that's okay because we're not being asked, and we don't need to know what the net force is right now. So that says that MA will be equal to the positive forces, which is the thrust, minus the frictional forces. So I'm going to do the algebra really quick. I want to get the frictional force by itself. So the first thing I'm going to do is to detach it from the thrust force by adding it to both sides of the equation. And that's going to say that the frictional force plus MA is equal to the thrust. And then if I uh, detach the MA, I'll subtract that from this side and the other side. And that will say that F of F is equal to the thrust force minus MA. Now again, it would be perfectly fine with me if you wanted to go ahead and put the numbers in. You have the acceleration is right there. You have the mass is right here. You have the thrust force is right there, 5,000 newtons. And then you can do the algebra after the fact. That's fine, fine. I don't see any problem with doing it that way. But ultimately at this point, we're ready now to plug in the numbers. So that was 5,000 minus 950 times five. And that would give us a frictional force of and you can double check this in your calculator, a frictional force of 250 Newtons. This is a very typical kind of problem where we're gonna make measurements of an object. Uh, some some of uh, the forces are known and some of them are unknown. And we're gonna work out what are the missing forces or how much force would be required to make this thing happen. This is the kind of thing engineers would do when they're preparing to build a building or any kind of, of um, vehicle, for example, is to think about the forces that are going to act on this object and what are going to be the results of those those forces? How balanced or unbalanced will those forces be? That's going to determine what the motion of the object is going to be like. Let's take a look at a, a little higher level of this same problem. Um, but this time, there's going to be a little less information about the actual value of the acceleration. So let's take a look at a very similar motorcycle. Um, so a motorcycle instead of a car, a little bit smaller vehicle, but we're going to have it accelerate. Just clearly, this is a second law problem because that's what the second law deals with is acceleration. But in this case, instead of being told the acceleration, you're told that it started from rest and traveled up to 25 meters per second over a distance of 50 meters. So the initial velocity, the final velocity, the distance, and the mass, but what I don't have is I don't have the acceleration, right? And that's the link between the previous chapters on velocity and acceleration and the current stuff on forces is the acceleration. The acceleration is the, the connecting point. So I'm gonna go through and just list all the information that was given to me. This is a quite a complex problem.
So sorting out what properties do I actually have is gonna be really crucial to thinking about where, what's our path forward. How do we come up with this missing piece of information, the net force acting on the motorcycle? You know, the final velocity, it said that it got up to 25 meters per second, and it did that over a distance of 50 meters. The question is asking, determine the net force. So that would be F net. Okay, so if you think about what information is given, there are no individual forces given. So there clearly a motorcycle is going to exert a thrust force to propel it forward. And since it's moving in the real world, there's gonna be drag and friction that are gonna restrain it. And so there's gonna be forces working against it. So there's at least two or three forces acting on the, the motorcycle. And I don't have any of those forces. I don't have any information about those. So this time looking at the individual forces is not going to be helpful to me, but what I can do is I can get the net force by just multiplying the mass by the acceleration if I just calculate the acceleration of this. Now what's important to recognize is that I have three pieces of information about the motion of this accelerating vehicle. I have the two velocities and the displacement and the piece of information that is really central to solving this problem is having the acceleration of the vehicle. So I'm not actually gonna solve this problem all the way to the end. I'm just gonna simply show up what would be the steps, which way would you work your way through, and then I'm, I'm going to ask that you would finish the problem by filling in the, the missing pieces of information or, or the information that we're going to leave out. So the equation that I'm gonna use with the initial and the final velocity and the distance is V squared equals V naught squared plus two AD. And I'm going to do a little bit of algebra on that to solve for A and see that A is equal to V squared minus V naught squared over two times D. And once we have the acceleration, then it's very easy to just move over and say that the net force would be equal to MA, and MA is equal to the mass of 250 kilograms times whatever we calculate to be the acceleration. So you can finish this problem by just plugging in the values over here under the acceleration, calculating the acceleration, and then calculating the net force by just transferring that value over and multiplying it by 250 and then you can put a box around it and you're all done with the problem. That's a pretty high level problem. That's a level three or four problem um, because it requires you to bring in information from the previous topic on acceleration and, and see the connection between accelerated motion and the kinematic equations that we used um, in the previous topics. Let's take a look at one last question. We've looked at everything uh, going horizontally so far. Let's just take one last look at a problem in the vertical direction and look at a rocket. So just like I did with the problem with the car, I'm gonna draw a free body diagram uh, and try to identify all the forces. And obviously one force that's going to be there is going to be the weight of the, of the rocket. Uh, all objects that we're going to be looking at have weight and undoubtedly the rocket has, has weight. Um, it tells me that the rocket is accelerating upward at 15 meters per second squared when the total drag force, so clearly there must be a drag force acting on it, is uh, 500,000 newtons. So I'm going to draw another arrow pointing downward. That is the drag force that is opposing the motion of the rocket because I know the motion of the rocket is upward. It said that it was accelerating in the upward direction. Now, the question is, do I draw the thrust arrow to be the same length as these two, which is probably somewhere about here? Or do I draw that arrow longer? Well, this says that the rocket is accelerating upward at 15 meters per second. So yes, the thrust arrow is significantly longer The thrust arrow is significantly longer than the other two combined. So if I add these two together, they will be less than the thrust force, and the result will be that the object will accelerate in the upward um, direction. So uh, in this case, there really are no horizontal forces acting on the object, so undoubtedly we're going to only look at the, at the vertical forces, and we're gonna do the same thing we did last time. I am not being asked what the net force is, and I don't actually need to calculate it to solve the, the problem. So I'm going to use the, the third example again, where I'm just gonna set the mass times the acceleration equal to the individual forces, but it's really crucial that I list all the forces accurately and make sure that I don't miss any of the, the forces that are acting on this. So MA is equal to, in this case, the thrust minus the weight minus the drag force, and that's basically it. There are no other forces that are acting on the rocket.
Um, one thing I just want to point out though is that we need the weight and we need the mass of the object. And there was a number given at the beginning of the problem. It said a three million Newton rocket. A three million Newton rocket is accelerating upward. What property are you being given there? Because in most of the problems, we were given something that said kilograms, a certain number of kilograms for a car or for a motorcycle or for the rope. But in this case, it didn't say kilograms, it said Newtons. So really important to understand, this is the weight. You're being given the weight. This would be the same thing as in American football, when you hear them say that it's a 250 pound linebacker, 250 pounds is a, it's a force. So when they put that in front of the, the object, it's very likely that what they're doing is they're saying that that's the weight of the object. And in this case, you were given the weight, W, so I don't need to calculate this this time. I already know what the weight is, but what I need is I need the, the mass, which I'm going to get by using the equation that W is equal to mg. So the weight of an object is equal to mass times the, the gravity at that particular location. So that means that mass would be W over G. And in this case, that's 3.0 times 10 to the sixth. And we'll just approximate that the value of gravity on the Earth is 10. So that means that our mass is 3.0 times 10 to the fifth, sorry, kilograms, kilograms. So that gives me the mass of the object. I have the acceleration is right there. I know that the drag force right here is 500,000 newtons. I know that the weight, which was right there, is 3 million newtons. And that only leaves one force left to, to solve for, and that is the thrust force. I'm going to do the algebra first, but again, if you want to put the numbers in and then do the algebra, that's fine. You could combine these two together to become one number. I, I, I can see an argument for that. But in this case, what's going to happen is I'm going to add the weight to both sides so that the weight and I'm also going to add the drag force to both sides so that both of those move over to the right side. And I'm going to end up with this final statement that MA plus the weight plus the drag force is equal to the thrust force. And we have all of those numbers. So first of all, the mass times 15 meters per second squared plus the weight. plus the um, drag force, which was 500,000 newtons. And that's equal to the thrust. So if you go through and you add all of these uh, together, then you will find that they all add up to a total thrust force of 8.0 times 10 to the sixth newtons or 8 million newtons of total thrust. And what does the thrust force need to do? What does it need to counteract? Well, first of all, it has to counteract the weight of the object in order to make it accelerate forward. And then also it has to counteract or balance out the drag force. And if it balanced out just those two, then the rocket would move with constant velocity. For example, it could hover if it just counteracts the weight and the drag force, or it can move upward as long as it balances two forces. But if it wants to do more than just move upward, if it wants to actually pick up speed as it moves upward, then it needs a little extra force. And that's where the MA comes from. The MA is that little extra force that an object needs in order to, to increase its speed or to decrease its speed. So that gives you a pretty good sample of some of the problems that you might face in the second law. And really crucial that you make the connection that the, the second law is all about the acceleration, and there are lots of other equations for accelerations that would allow you to solve very complex problems.